Hey gardeners, I have a real treat today. I am honored to be meeting with Dr. Douglas Tallamy, one of the scientists leading the movement of home gardeners to add native plants back into their gardens. He's written several books on why this is such an important topic and such an urgent issue. Um, so Dr. Tallamy, would you please share with us your extensive experience and maybe summarize the bottom line results of your studies? Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I've been doing this for 41 years, so we'll start at the beginning. Okay. Now, yeah, I, I'm an entomologist at the University of Delaware, and um, my experience has been with how insects interact with plants. We learned all about that in graduate school back in the 70s, and one of the major take-home messages was that the insects that eat plants do it by specializing on particular plants so that it enables them to get around the plant defenses. Plants don't want to be eaten, so for an insect to actually take advantage of the energy in the plant, they have to come up with specialized enzymes to, to store and excrete and detoxify the nasties that are in the plant. Sometimes behavioral adaptations, like the monarch snipping uh, veins of the, of the milkweed leaves to block the flow of latex sap, or life history adaptations where you only come out early in the season when there aren't very many plant defenses. All of those things have to fall into place before the insect can actually take advantage of the plant. And 90% of the insects that eat plants are specialized that way. Yeah. Uh, well, when we load our landscapes with plants from other continents, our insects have not been able to specialize on those plants. People say, well, they've been here for 100 years. And it's true in a lot of cases, but that's not nearly enough time for insects to develop those adaptations. Uh, so, so for example, if you, if you take away the milkweeds in your yard and replace them with hostas, the monarch has two choices. It's not going to adapt to hostas. It's going to fly away and find milkweed someplace else or starve to death. Those are its two choices. Yeah. And that's what we've been doing all over the country. We've got 135 million acres of residential landscapes, and they are dominated by plants from someplace else, which means over all that space, we've, we've uh, really hammered the food web that produces the insects that then the birds need and everything else. I mean, there's so many insects are, are the most important group in terms of transferring energy from plants to other animals. Um, so, so I know gardeners don't want to hear it, but it really is all about making insects. <laughs> yeah. but, then, but you're going to create a, a, a diverse trophic system in your yard. So you'll have the plants, you'll have the insects that eat them, but then you'll have all those things that eat those insects. And yeah. that is a lot of creatures. So in the end, you, you don't have plants that are defoliated and you know, part of the, the mental jump for everybody has been to realize that plants are more than decorations. Yeah. When we think they're decorations, we get the prettiest plants from all over the world and we don't want anything to touch them, mm -hmm. which means they're <laughs> decorations, but they're not part of a living ecosystem. Yeah, I, and, I know I've been struggling with that too. Like, wait, I'm supposed to let the bugs eat my plants? Oh, encourage you them, know. encourage them, that's right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, well, you know, that is that has been my message for the last, uh, it's almost 20 years now. Yeah. Um, and and I guess it will be my message until I hang up the pen or whatever you hang up. <laughs> well, I, I hope to continue to spread it for you here in my little little following on YouTube and Appreciate whatnot. That. Yeah. Um, and this is just, this is so exciting to me. I stumbled on your books. I don't even remember how. And I've now finished all three of them. And um, I, I just am fascinated by it. And I think one of the reasons that I'm so interested in this is because it's something that every person, any person can make a little difference. Even, you know, nobody can go change the whole world, but we can all do something with the space we have. Even somebody in an apartment can put a plant in a pot on their balcony or in their windowsill, right? And um, it's just such a simple thing. <laughs> it, is, it is truly a grassroots movement. You know, the planet has has two crises. We've got climate change and we've got the biodiversity crisis. Yeah. And if we had no climate change, we would still have the biodiversity crisis because we have not shared our spaces yeah. with nature. You know, we like nature, but we want it to be someplace else. Right. And if there was someplace else, that'd be OK. But we're everywhere now. Yeah. So the only solution is to coexist with the natural world. And that's where everybody becomes involved. Uh, not, 
it's your responsibility. I mean, this is not optional. To, to have a world without the natural systems that support us is not an option. Right. So, you know, in the past, we've had just a few specialists, like a few conservation biologists and a few ecologists, and they're supposed to fix the world. Everybody else has a green light to, to wreck it. That doesn't make any sense. No. So I want to I want to emphasize the responsibility that every human being on the planet has towards healthy ecosystems. And the reason they have that responsibility is because we all need them. We totally depend on them. 100%. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to survive without insects as much as we like to deny that fact. <laughs> you know? um, okay, so I'd like to take just a couple of minutes um, to talk about your books. So you've written these three and then you've co-authored several more, is that right? One more, co-authored with Rick, Rick Dark, one more, The Living Landscape, right? Okay. All right. Well, fine. One more. <laughs> it's still four more than I've written. So, you know, uh, you're young. You're young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got time left, right? I've started several. Have I finished oh, them? Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, you wrote them, I think, in this order, right? Nature of Oaks was first. No. That Nature of Oaks was last. Oh, so really? bringing nature, bringing nature home was first. Okay. And followed then, by Nature's Best Hope, followed by Nature Books. Okay. Well, I, I read them Nature's Best Hope and then Bringing Nature Home, and then I just finished Nature of Oaks. And they were all fascinating and wonderful for their own reasons. Um, so, folks, I'll be posting a book review on all three of these books probably next winter. So make sure to, you know, continue to follow so you can see that. But suffice it to say that I highly recommend them. I think my favorite takeaway is that these much needed changes that we're talking about, um, they need to be voluntary and, I, and they cannot be mandated. And so I completely agree that doing every, anything by mandate is only going to backfire and cause fighting and discourse <clears throat> more, of that, more of that than actually making a difference. So if adding native plants became a politically divisive issue, then we'd spend more time arguing than planting and we'd lose sight of the goal, which is to restore and save our native pollinators, insects, and wildlife. And you used the analogy carrots, not sticks. And I think that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it was very good. Make it, make it something we want to do. Chase the carrot, don't use a stick. Um, and I also saw a quote recently that I thought was wonderful and fitting for this conversation. It said, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And uh, yeah. That was Who said thing. that? I don't remember. It was a meme I saw on Facebook or something. Or did you say it? I don't know. <laughs> I know. I, you know, it was funny. I was tracking down a quote. This was a while ago. I said, that sounds really good. I got to find out who said that. And every, every place I tracked in, it, it said that I said it. <laughs> probably, a very short memory. <laughs> you probably said it in some talk and everybody went, oh, that was so great. And they wrote it down. Well, it, it must be true. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, so I'll also put links to all of these books in the description below, as well as a few other resources, um, like the websites you recommend and some Facebook groups that focus on these methods. Um, so make sure to check out the description, folks. Okay, so on to questions, right? So after I finished Nature's Best Hope, I am now ready to change the way I garden, right? Which is, I've been gardening professionally for 15 years and really for my whole life. And so this is a big mind shift. Um, and I've now finished listening to the audio versions of all three books. And I think most of my questions were answered by the end of the third one, but I know that I have a, had a lot in mind while I was reading. And so I'm sure I'm not the only one, which is why I reached out to you. Um, I wanna make sure that the changes I'm making are correct. So I've always gardened conventionally, taking care of the typical Asian and European species that everyone has, not really thinking much of it aside from enjoying how beautiful they are. But I've planted a fair number of things that I've recently learned are not beneficial to our environment, or they may even be harmful, like burning bushes, butterfly bushes, barberries, and Chanticleer pears. Aside from barberries, I love all of those plants. <laughs> you know? um, several of the invasive weeds that we battle on a regular basis were originally brought over as ornamentals, but they escaped their gardens and started taking over the surrounding wildlands and outcompeting natives because there was no natural control, which is what we were talking about, specialized insects, right? 
but I think most of our garden specimens fall in a category of inert plants. So they don't benefit our ecology, but they don't really cause harm either. Is my assumption there accurate? Yes, <clears throat> I, I like to think of those species, something like a forsythia or a ginkgo mm -hmm. uh, or a crepe myrtle. They're not invasive. Yeah. They're not contributing either. So I, I think of them as statues. So the, the question is, how many statues do you want in your yard? You know, a few is okay, but. Yeah, yeah, that, that, was, that was the question I had the entire time I was reading Nature's Best Hope was, do we have to tear out all of our favorite plants? Yeah. Like, that's going to be a hard sell for a lot of people. Um, but we, we actually did, did some research on that. Um, yeah. Where he with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And, and the question was, what does it take to sustain a chickadee population? Mm -hmm. in terms of native plants. Uh, and the answer was for this one particular study, uh, now chickadees forage on woody plants. So we looked at woody plants. Mm -hmm. If you have 70% of your woody plant biomass native, you could sustain a chickadee population. When it exceeds that, then, uh, then deaths exceed births and it's unsustainable, which means you can have up to 30% of your woody plants like the ginkgo and all the other things um, without destroying the local food web. Now that doesn't, you know, we are going to draw the line at invasive plants, at the burning bush and, and the calorie pear, and because they're ecological tumors, they escape and then they just keep growing and they keep displacing the plants that do support the food web. And I just, if, if I can add this, um, they're not evil plants. It's the conditions we've created for them. And one of those conditions is an overabundance of deer because the deer do not eat those plants, but they do love our natives. So any little native that pops up, the deer eat and they don't touch the burning bush and the other things. So it, it tips the competitive adva advantage toward the non-natives. It makes them look like super plants. Mm -hmm. But if we, in the absence of deer herbivory, many of our, our natives are highly competitive. You know, they, they do just fine. But uh, when the deer eats every oak tree when it's two inches tall, it doesn't have much of a chance. And that's what's happening with overabundance of deer from coast to coast. So that is one of the features that has really encouraged the invasiveness of a lot of these non-natives. Yeah, that's interesting. Even so, even though deer are native because they only eat the natives, it's just clearing the ground for more invasives. They're native, but so were their predators, and we got rid of their predators. So ah, yeah, that's, that's the imbalance there. We have, in, in many places, we have 14 times more deer than the environment can support. That's called carrying capacity. That's not natural. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Oh, man. Um, about like burning bushes specifically, I had no idea that burning bushes were a problem until very recently. I've never seen them reproduce. I mean, I've never seen them in our forest here in Spokane. Um, aside from a few manageable seedlings under the parent plant in the spring, I've seen that like twice. I, it never occurred to me that it was a problem. Um, and I see the birds eating the seeds in mine every winter. So I always thought they were important forage. And then I recently learned that they were non-native, that the birds are dispersing the seeds in the wildlands. Again, I'm not sure if that's happening in Spokane, but it's definitely happening on the East Coast, right? Um, <laughs> it has already happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've seen the much, pictures. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> it's much terrible. of New England is, is just uh, the understory is all burning bush. Oh. Uh, but that brings up a good point. All invasive plants are not equally invasive in all parts of the country. Yeah. I can guarantee that burning bush is not invasive in the Mojave Desert. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. It's not a problem. Uh, and so, so like, I, I'm yeah, trying to balance yeah. when I talk to my clients. I'm like, I haven't seen this here, but I know it's a problem in other areas. And so for me personally, I'm not going to contribute to something that could be a problem. So I'm not going to plant these anymore. And I'm actually going to start taking them out wherever I can. Um, well, I will add that when I started talking about these things and the East Coast, I would regularly, it's, it's always in a conference and there's a bunch of speakers. I would hear all the time how English ivy is not invasive in the East. It's invasive in Portland, but oh. not in the East. And of course, nobody says that anymore because it's highly invasive everywhere. So, so there's this lag time and yeah. so you never know. 
you know, if it's invasive one place, you should be highly suspicious. Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely an important takeaway right there. Like, let's learn from you guys before we have a problem on the West Coast and start fixing it now. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then something that really shocked me that I read in your book was that the seeds of burning bushes and all the Asian shrubs, I think you said, are not even nutritionally sufficient for the birds that are eating them. And that was like, that's it, I'm taking mine out. Like, I'm not gonna feed my birds something that's not actually going to uh, nourish them. So that, that was the real nail in the coffin for me on those plants. Yeah, um, you know, most birds, we always talk about reproduction because you don't have birds unless they reproduce. And 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, not seeds. Okay. Their baby birds cannot eat seeds. Yeah. Uh, but most of the invasive shrubs that we have, it's the bird that's eating the berry surrounding the seed. They're mm -hmm. not eating the seed at all. They're going to poop oh. that out later on. And that's that's what makes it invasive. Yeah. Uh, so I think what you're referring to are the berries, uh, particularly from Asian plants that are very high in sugar in the fall. Yeah. It was in the fall. Birds. Our plants, I mean, our birds, uh, they're either overwintering and they need high fat berries or they're migrating and they need high fat berries to, and to fuel the migration. Yeah, that was what it was. And, and that's, yeah, um, they're, they're, they're getting, a, you know, a big dose of, of sugar during the migration when they need a big dose of, of fat. Yeah, yeah. And people say, well, they're eating it. Why do they do that? Well, if you look at an invasion, that's all that's there. What are they they're supposed to eat? Because, yeah. <laughs> So I eat what's available. There's nothing else because that's all there is. Uh, oh, my goodness. OK, so my question that I was leading up to was, how do you know if a specimen plant is harmful or not? And if it's not on the noxious weed list, right? Because I, I know the noxious weed list. Burning bushes aren't on there. Mm -hmm. um, and can you tell us the things that we should consider when deciding if we should keep or remove specimen plants from our gardens? Now, the noxious weed lists were um, created largely with agriculture in mind. They weren't thinking about invasive plants in natural areas. It was, is it hurting the local farmer? So it's actually a very restricted list compared to what's ecologically harmful. So how do you know? Well, you know, these days, finding information is a whole lot easier than it, than it used to be. You could look up for your county or your state, say a list of invasive plants for, for Washington. Yeah. Or for Spoke Camp, for whatever, and you will find it. And there'll be a list there. Is it on that list? Now, that's not even good enough because that list should be changing. So, for example, in the East here, we plant Zelkova all over the place. It kind of looks like elm, and mm -hmm. um, and it's not on any invasive species list. But I, I look in the woods behind my my mother-in-law's retirement community, where they lined the street with Zelkova. It's the only tree there, and the woods are full of them. So it. If it's not on a list now, it will be in, in, in as soon as somebody wakes up. Right. Oh, so, you know, how do you know? It's a good question. How do you know? Uh, S Walker, if you see a plant growing in the wild that was not planted, it's yeah. invasive. It got there on its own. Now, there's a level of invasiveness. Yeah. So, you know, not everything's equally invasive. Olympic people call them naturalized. It sounds nice. It sounds like they're joining the rest of nature and everything's working out. And some plants do do that. Some plants are in there. We don't see any, you know, they're, they're occupying space, but you know, not that much. And I don't worry about them. I, it's, it's the thugs that are taking over and excluding all the others. All you need to do is, is look at a kudzu invasion or a burning bush invasion or a calorie pear invasion or a Himalayan blackberry invasion, and you get it that um, there's nothing else there. That's what we need to avoid. So coming up with the plants that are doing that in your yard, it shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> <laughs> Theoretically. I mean, I, I think the only, the biggest challenge is knowing if a plant is already native or not. Like, again, professional landscaper, 15 years, I only know what's in the nurseries. This whole native thing is brand new. And I'm like, this, there's so many. <laughs> There, there are uh, very useful websites for that. There's, there's some, something called BONAP, B-O-N-A-P. And, and uh, the acronym is for the biota of North America plants, something like that. Uh, but just put in BONAP and it will pop up. And then this, the, the genus of plant that you're 
looking for. So presumably, you know the genus of your plant. Right. Um, then it will list every species that occurs in the U.S., both the natives and the non-natives. So a lot of genera have non-native species that are here, along with the natives. And it will tell you exactly where they, they occur by county. So it's the most accurate way of tracking down, is this plant native to my area uh, or not? And where does it occur? Well, so that great. you go to Bonap, all your questions are answered. I love it. I love it. I'm going to look into that this afternoon. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, and that kind of leads into my next question, which was, is there a, re a resource to find out which of our common landscape plants are doing this much damage? So like I can refrain from making similar mistakes in the future. Um, you know, that's local. So for example, in Delaware, we have a pamphlet. Here are the invasive plants. Here's what you can use to, to get something similar. Yeah. But that was a local effort that that you know we we did. I, I, it probably exists in a lot of states. I can't speak for for you guys, but um, but it could very well exist. That is something that your your university extension agent should have. It should be available. That's a good idea too. Yeah, I'll check into that. I know I have their booklets of like you know some of the native species and things, but I'm not sure if they're comprehensive. And I'm quite sure they don't have lists of things that are a problem. So I'll, I'll look into that as well. Okay, so you recommended goldenrod and asters as two keystone flowering plants that we should definitely add to our gardens. Are there any other spe specific, are there any others specific to Spokane or Eastern Washington that you know of that we should definitely consider adding? Like I'd love to plant oaks everywhere, but the fact is that most yards just don't have that much space. So I'm mostly interested in shrubs and perennials that will make the biggest impact. Right. You know, when you when you write a book uh, for timber precious, they want it to be have national coverage, not regional. Mm -hmm. So uh, goldenrod and asters and and sunflowers, perennial sunflowers and evening primrose. Um, they're top plants over most of the country, but not all of the country. You are way up there in the Pacific Northwest, and a lot of options start to drop out. Nope. Um, so, so whatever I suggest has got to be regionally appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, <so we're, laughs> I know, right? That's where that's where I'm struggling right now. <laughs> and unfortunately, and and this is this is frustrating to a lot of people because the farther north you go, the fewer options you have, the fewer native options, yet you're benign enough that a lot of things will grow there. So this is the tendency to, to uh, start planting a whole bunch of Mediterranean species. And, yep. uh, and I understand that. I understand that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you go a little bit farther south, I'm not sure how far up it goes, but Ceanothus is a bunch of Ceanothus options. Uh, very, very powerful plant. Um, not familiar with that one, but again, if it's well throughout California up into Oregon, does it drop out by by uh, yeah? Like I don't California know. lilac is a CNO. This is a you know oh. that's just the genus, but yeah, yeah. I mean, we have tons of lilacs, but I'm pretty sure they're not native. That's actually our city flower, is lilacs. Well, those that's that's the genus syringa, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So this is not a true lilac. It's just called California because it has a purple flower. Oh, okay. I gotcha. I knew yeah. that too. Wow. <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, I know you have a website, Native Plant Finder. I tried to use it, but I think it's more specific to the East Coast. Is that right? No, every county in the country. Okay. okay. I mean, your zip code and the ranked list, the best best plant genera for your county will pop up. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. And it, and it, it works well in most places. California has something called... Um, Calscape, which is, it's just more accurate. They have every single plant species geo-referenced in California. So if you put in a species, it will, all the dots where it occurs in the entire state show up, That's which is handy because in California, the counties are huge and they cover in a single county, you can have three or four different biomes, yeah. which makes the native plant finder, which is by county, not that useful. Um, but in most other places, the counties are smaller and it's not multiple biomes. So it is pretty useful. And I'm going to, I'm going to throw Washington in there. I think it's pretty useful in Washington. Yeah. Yeah. I did find quite a few. Um, 
I just I wasn't sure if it was how specific it was. So that's really good to know that it's by county. I'll I'll look mm -hmm. again into that mm -hmm. and uh, uh, make sure to. I'll probably just print the lists to be perfectly honest. Um, all right. So for about a year, maybe two years now, um, I've been learning about xeriscapes, pollinator gardens, and native plants. Um, I always used to think that a pollinator garden just meant there needs to be lots of flowers. Like that's all you need is flowers. And I can do that. That's great. Well, eh, no. <laughs> so um, I now know better. I was a bit surprised when I learned that only certain flowers actually make any difference. So um, after reading your books, I was inspired to post a monthly video on my YouTube channel showcasing a native plant, maybe more frequent, but we'll start with monthly because, you know, I'm don't have a lot of spare time i'm sure you can imagine mm. uh, but that way i can educate my viewers while i learn myself so folks remember to stand by for that plant showcase series that'll be starting hopefully this summer um so here, here's the thing with a pollinator garden yeah. yes you want flowers keep in mind uh, a lot of woody plants are very important pollinator plants yeah. they bloom too uh, and many times their flowers are not big and showy. So for example, um, you know, our native hollies, they have tiny little flowers. They're magnets to many of our, our native bees. So first of all, when you think about pollinators, you gotta get beyond honeybee. Uh, that's the one non-native bee that we do rely on. And it's important generalists, but we have almost 4,000 species of native bees. And every time we measure it, they're all in decline. So we have to worry about them as well. Uh, and of those species, more than a third of them are what we call specialists. They can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. So the object is to plant for the specialists because the generalists, like many bumblebees and the honeybee, can use the specialist plants too. And they do use them. Yeah. But the specialists can't use the generalist plants. So if you only plant uh, and this is where planting non-native flowers like zinnias and the things that, that insects do go to, this is what confuses people because you, you will get honeybees and a few bumblebees and a few other things and butterflies are coming, they're sucking the nectar. Yeah. Uh, but you're only meeting the needs of a few generalist species. You're not meeting the needs of any of the specialists. Um, and yeah. it's, so and that's, that's even more confusing because bees will go to flowers to get the nectar, which they need but it's the pollen that it counts because they can't reproduce on nectar, they reproduce on pollen and it's gotta be specific pollens for a lot of, of species. So focus on the, the specialist bees and then you're satisfying everybody's need. Now, how do you know what the specialist bees are, right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, uh, we, we do have a new tool um, improving it, but right now you can go to, again, a National Wildlife Federation website uh, it's called Keystone Plants for Caterpillars and, and Bees, or Pollinators. Keystone Plants for Pollinators. Uh, and it will list, and it's by bioregion. And it's by bioregion at bioregion level one, which is, that's the problem. It's very general. But you can look, you say, okay, I'm in this bioregion. There's a map there to tell you where you'd live. And here's a list of the specialist bees and the plants that they, they need for your bioregion. Now we want to move it to bioregion level two, which is more specific. Um, and you can more accurately pinpoint where you are. But uh, it's the first time that any knowledge of the, the specialist bee requirements has been available to the, the natural pub, to the, the public who can actually address these issues. So, for example, in my yard, if I don't have goldenrod, um, uh, there's 11 species of bees that will not be able to reproduce in my, my yard. If I don't have goldenrod and asters, if I don't have goldenrod, asters, and um, perennial sunflowers, there's 44 species of bees that can't breed there. So, but if I do have them, I get all the bees because, the, you know, honeybees, everybody uses goldenrod and these other things. So you can really target, you can target these, these specialist bees. There are a lot of plants that only have one or two specialists on them, like, like spring beauties here uh, in, the, in the east. It's got a specialist bee. Yeah. It's only one. <laughs> so, so this is where diversity comes in. The more diversity you can have in your flowering plants, the more uh, specialist bees you're going to satisfy. Yeah. And of course, the other big challenge is having blooms throughout the season mm -hmm. because bees don't just reproduce for a week 
you know, they, they're now there's a sequence of species that goes through the, uh, you know, through the season, uh, but most of them, you know, they're going to be around at least a month. So you need a sequence of blooms from whenever plants start blooming in Washington all the way till when they stop. And that's most of the year, I think, for you guys. Yeah, there's about November, it really peters off and then it starts up again in March. Yeah, yeah. And that's the biggest challenge. That's the big, particularly for people with small yards. How do you get all those blooms in your small yard? Right, and especially and this is where, goldenrod that tends to spread. You know, <laughs> well, there are there are you know clumping goldenrods that that don't spread very much. So you might want to focus on those. But um, this is where neighborhood collaboration becomes important. You know, a bee doesn't care about your yard; it cares about its foraging range, and it's probably you know 20, 30 yards. If you look at the, the over that that 30 yard space, somebody's going to have more sun than somebody else. And you can, you know, it takes coordination. We can say, OK, you you do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, and we'll meet the needs. We'll have something blooming all the time. That means you have to talk to your neighbor. That could be a that could be. A, you know, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> no, you kill it right there. But uh, yeah, yeah. there's some neighbors I would never speak to and others that I'm good friends with. I get it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. So I talk to a lot of people about their gardens. And one of the biggest objections I hear about Xeriscape's native gardens and pollinator gardens is the stigma that they're messy or ugly or they're dry, they're barren, whatever. So what would you say to people who have that opinion? Uh, your garden is as messy as you make it. <laughs> I mean, I've got, I'd love to show you a slide right now. It's the most formal garden I've ever seen, um, taken by a drone 400 feet up. It's a big garden. It is totally formal. And every plant in it is a native plant. Oh, that's Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Uh, so it, a lot of people do equate native gardening with no gardening. You just don't do anything. And what's there is going to be native, which is probably not true. It'll be all the non-natives that, that, that come in, but... Mm -hmm. uh, and you can do that, but uh, when I say reduce the area of lawn you have, I say reduce. I don't say get rid of. Lawn is a great cue for care. You can mow it and formalize it. It's a way you move around your yard, uh, and it shows this is intentional. I just want more plants in the yard, more plants that are contributing. We've got contributors, we've got non-contributing plants, and we've got detractors. Focus on the contributors. Uh, and you can you can have as formal a garden as you want. Yeah, I love it. Is there a, I know lawn alternatives are becoming very popular and it's something I'm experimenting with myself. Is there a species of ground cover or whatnot that you would recommend for lawns? I know we're doing, we're all doing clover, but that's European. So it's <laughs> Well, you know, cl clover blooms and it's good for some of those specialist bees like honeybees and bumblebees, they use it. So yeah. it's much better than, than not having clover. And if you have clover in your yard, it shows that you did not choose a fertilizer with a broad spectrum herbicide yes. that kills everything except grass. Yeah. So, so that's a plus. That's a plus. Oh, uh, you, know, there, you know, there really is no other plant uh, that can take human traffic walking on without being killed as good as grass does. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I say use it as if if you are in a place where you have enough water for grass. So I'm not recommending this for Los Angeles. Right. They don't have one drop of water for one blade of grass. Right. Uh, so then you come up with other alternatives. But you know, if you get a decent amount of rain, you can have you can have grass without breaking the water budget. Just just use it as a path. Uh, Thomas Rayner says use it as an area rug, not as a wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Aww. And that way you can get a whole bunch more plants into your landscape that are contributors. That's that's where we want to go. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, my goodness. All right. Are there any more nuggets of wisdom you'd like to share with us before we sign off? You know, the one I keep hammering is this totally new notion to a lot of people that you do have a responsibility to do this stuff. You do have a responsibility to take care of the ecosystem that supports you. It's not going to be somebody else. And you certainly have a responsibility to not wreck it. <laughs> yeah. You know, in this case, benign is better than than nothing. Uh, but right now, most so much of what we do on a daily basis actively destroys local ecosystems. So um, that's that's where we have to change the culture. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. I've been telling people a lot, plant these, these things, the keystone plants, and then don't then stop spraying everything that moves. And support, <laughs> support local conservation efforts. You know, in Washington, you're cutting down the one oak species you have, Quercus gariana, to put up warehouses. You know, the, the, if the public rose up, you'd stop doing that you know this 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 is the most valuable plant you have and you're cutting it down for another warehouse it's just crazy yeah so. oh man well we will we'll do our part to stop okay. that <laughs> yes. all right well i suppose we should probably wrap up because we're going to get cut off here in a minute anyway but um but thank you so much for your time dr Tallamy. this was incredibly valuable and illuminating um and Look, we, to, we can do this again anytime you want. I would love to because I have a whole other series of questions. Okay. Yeah, I figured you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So stand by for that, folks. We'll reschedule another one of these. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you enjoyed this content and want to follow us as we learn these new techniques to do our part to help our environment, remember to subscribe and turn on the notifications. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them below. If I can answer them, I will. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Uh, and thanks again, and I'll see you in the garden. <laughs>